I always appreciate when I get that text Saturday or Friday and Justin's thinking about the lesson and the songs. Uh, I've always appreciated a song leader who would take the lesson and make it more, you know, than what it can be in just, you know, the 55 minutes that I preach. So, um, <laughs> I was waiting for you guys to catch on that one. <laughs> this morning, I was, I was putting my socks on in my bedroom. I hear my wife say, it's a good thing these whitening strips have really helped me with my years of smoking and drinking wine. And I thought, well, my wife doesn't drink or smoke. And it's, you know, the package. She was reading the package of the whitening strip she uses. And it talks about how it can take away years of drinking and smoking, you know, or years of, yeah, smoking wine, drinking and smoking. And I was thinking to myself about, you know, that statement in this morning's lesson. If somebody were to hear that, right, just that comment, what would you think? If you don't know my wife, what would you think? Well, she smokes and she likes to drink and she covers it up with whitening strips, right? <laughs> and a lot of times we do that, don't we? We make real quick judgments. I got a bunch of pictures up here. And if you were to look at them carefully, all of them, in my opinion, tell a different story. Maybe about what's happening that day to the person, where they grew up, right? What kind of life they've lived or are living. And unfortunately, pictures in the moment don't always tell you the full story, right? You, if you've ever seen a family photo with kids, in a lot of mine, you would think one of my kids is a very unhappy child most of the time. He just doesn't like pictures. He doesn't like to have his picture taken. He doesn't like them. And so when you see him, you know, you get years and years and years of family photos and you get one over, you know, or one's crying or one's this or one's that. And the parents, you know, hair's out of place because they've been trying to wrangle the kid over to get him in. And, you know, it, it's just pictures don't always tell you something. But pictures, you know what they can do? Is they tell you that life isn't always as simple as we make it out. You know, when someone says they're a good person, well, what does that mean? What do you mean by you're a good person? Does that, are you perfect? Well, no, I'm not talking about good and perfect. Well, when you think of good, well, I, I help people when I can, right? I do, you know, kind things for people. I don't beat, you know, my children. I'll, you know, we start naming those kinds of things. And we have our measures by which we hopefully judge ourselves, but also by which we judge others. And um, Hope actually wrote the sermon for this morning, uh, you know, usually she puts it in the bulletin and it's, you know, sometimes a different title. Well, this time I said, you tell me, right, what the, what the title is. Now, me and Hope were talking this morning and I appreciate Hope. She came up to me a couple weeks ago. I made a statement from the pulpit and she says, you know, I disagree with something that you said. By the way, I love when people come up to me and tell me these things, right? And she said, you made this comment and I made a comment that even as I was making it, I realized it was going to come across probably not in the best way, but decided not to get bogged down on it and explain it all that much. And she says, you know, um, I disagree and here's why. And I actually agreed with her reasoning. And she goes, oh, you know, it's kind of like she heard me say one thing. She thought, one thing about it and realize we actually, though I said something completely different than what I really meant and what she thought, we actually ended up believing really the same thing on the subject. And it was about, before anyone gets all, you know, what false teaching, you know, that I miss. It was um, me making the statement about me not always preaching basic sermons, right? And what I, what I meant by that was the fact that I tend to to stick to sermons that are a little weightier and the basic ones, you know, sometimes I forget about, but I, it gave the impression that I just don't like to preach basic sermons. And that's not always true. Um, so we can make snap judgments. And if we don't talk about it, what can happen? What could have happened with hope if she would have never came and talked with me? Well, she would have had that same impression about that lesson and what I said until we talked about it. 
And so we do that all the time, right? Whether you're in the grocery store, you know, you see a mother who's screaming at her kids. And you thought, you know, what kind of mother screams at her kid in, kid in public? Well, you know, I thought that until I had kids in public. Um, and I was very concerned about, you know, those kids, man, those poor kids, right? What about poor parents, you know? Some, and that, now, obviously, sometimes parents go above and the things they say. I'm not, you know, making an excuse for every screaming or yelling. But sometimes you got to ask, well, what has led up to this point? What has led up to this point where it has caused this mother to, to go off, we'll say, on their children in the store, which may be a good thing, may not be a good thing. I'm not bringing that up. But a lot of times when we make judgments, we also have to recognize there's more to the story than what we are seeing and what we are hearing. So a lot of times when we make these snap judgments, we hear things that are not always the right things. Have you ever walked by a conversation and you heard, and you kind of go, they're talking about that, right? They're, they're, why, are, why would they be discussing this? Well, if maybe if you would have just heard the sentence before, or the sentence after, or the explanation of how they even got on this subject in the first place, you wouldn't even think to yourself, well, why were they talking? Of course they're talking about that. This happened, right? And so we hear things... And we make judgments, right? We mishear things and we make judgments. Sometimes we may hear an entire thing in a context, like in a sermon or in a Bible class, and a teacher made a comment, and we say, you know what, I completely disagree with that. I have actually had it happen to me where a person has come up to me and says, you know what, you said this and it is completely wrong. And the moment they start explaining, I went, you never listen to the rest of the sermon. Because after that statement, I went on to explain why actually that statement doesn't really fully describe what I actually believe. And if you would have just kept listening, but they shut their ears and they actually told me, they said, at that moment, I stopped listening to you. And I thought, well, you know, that's one way to do it, right? That's one way. And I got out my, my phone and I pulled up that sermon and I went right to where I knew they were talking and we listened to my statement. And then I said, just keep listening. And you watch their face completely change as I, and it wasn't here, by the way, um, as I continued my conversation, they go, oh, maybe... Just maybe I should have kept listening, right? And so we don't always hear things, even when we hear the full context, we may have an impression about something, or we may think, well, he's speaking about me, right? He's talking about me. And so we make all these quick snap judgments, and we got to be careful. Sometimes when we see things, I remember one time I was in Meadville, and uh, we had a situation that had happened where uh, a person was caught walking into a local pub late at night. And, you know, someone saw him. They start talking. They start spreading. We have to meet about it. We have to have a men's meeting, call it out. And nobody had talked to this person up until we pulled them into this meeting, why are you at this place? We know what goes on at these places at 1130 at night, and there's nothing good. He said, well, actually, I got a phone call from a friend who was in trouble who needed my help, and I went and got him. You know how utterly ridiculous everybody felt in that room for believing, because this person was not that kind of person. Right? That would have been at that place at that time. And you see things and you mischaracterize people in situations. So we don't want to do that. And I want to look at some times in Scripture where this happened. We were read this morning the tax collector and the Pharisee, right? I mean, if you were to just judge based on appearance, take a snapshot, you saw a tax collector 
give me a quick preview of who the tax collector is, give me a quick you know, overview of the Pharisees' life and actions of what they did, guess what your first impressions would be. The Pharisee is the more righteous man. That, right? The Pharisee even agreed with, he would have agreed with you. Because in his prayer, what does he pray? I'm glad I'm not like the adulterers, right? The thieves, all the fornicators, right? All the people who do X, Y, and Z. And look at all the things that I do do for God. I tithe, right? I give back. I help people. I am a good person. And that's what people would have seen. Then you look at the tax collector. And you would have saw a man who probably didn't live the cleanest life. If he was a tax collector, 99% chance he was caught up in embezzling money for the person he worked with. Almost 99. That's why when you meet um, Zacchaeus, who was the head over tax collectors, he even talks about when Jesus came to him and, went, and, and they had the conversation. He says, I will give back basically the money that I stole from people. That's just what tax collectors were. When you, by that time in the first century, if you'd signed up to be a tax collector, you were in an embezzling ring. That's just what you were a part of. And yet... When you look at the man's heart and sincerity about the life that he lived, how did he feel about his own life? He didn't like it. You ever find someone who's caught up in something and they don't want to be a part of it, but they don't have a way out? Right? If I stop this, as a tax collector, if he stops being a tax collector, guess who's going to take him in? Not his mom and dad. Not his family. If he's lucky, his family will forgive him. But chances are in the Jewish society, once you go on tax collector, there's no coming back. And you can see that even when Jesus is sitting with tax collectors and sinners. You might as well equate a tax collector with a sinner. And that's what they did. There are times where tax collectors were probably worse sinners than other of your regular, you know, average folk. And so even a person who's living a life that we know is wrong, we may not see the inside of that person's life begging and screaming for help to get out. And if we put up such walls and barriers on those kinds of people, how are we as children of light as followers of Jesus, ever going to help people caught up in those messes. Now, is it always true that a person who's living a sinful life feels bad about it and remorse about it and is internally upset about it? No, the Bible actually speaks the opposite of that. Is it always true whenever you see a religious person and they do good things and nice things and give back to God that they've got a heart that is rotting and, and, and you know, uh, selfish and prideful? No. That's why, even with the tax collector and the Pharisee, you can't make these snap kind of judgments. Look at Paul. What was Paul? He was a Pharisee. Yet he would tell you that his conscience, when he was doing his Pharisaical duties, which he thought he was doing for God, he said it was clean. You look at Nicodemus. A man who had been raised a Pharisee went to Jesus' night, and John shows us his progression that Jesus could even change a Pharisee. And the list can go on, right? The list can go on of the people that Jesus helped change. But you can't see those people's hearts and lives. Okay? Acts chapter 2 and verse 7. After the Spirit falls on the apostles... And everybody around them is amazed at what's going on. What is the statement that they make? Are these not Galileans? Now, if you're from Galilee, that would be like, you know, pick the podunk town in Tennessee that is near us, where you thought nothing's good come from there, right? Kind of like Nazareth. Nothing's good come from there. They're not really educated, right? Um... You know, their cousins get a little too close, right? You know, that's what you start thinking. 
And if you see somebody come out of there, you already, hey, you're from there, right? I'm from New York. To y'all, I'm a Yankee, right? You know, and if you ever actually go to New York outside of New York City, you will come to realize that most of New York also would wish we could cut off New York City and let them drift off on their own island, of the, you know, into the ocean, right? Um, pretty much think a lot of the same things, see life the same way, but we're from New York. So we must be a certain kind of person, right? And what I have found, we got people here from West Virginia, we got people here from Michigan, from Florida, right? All over and all are here doing what this morning? Worshiping the same God, loves the same Savior, are all reliant upon our same Redeemer this morning, Jesus Christ. And so if we're going to make snap judgments, right now I could go around and just by looking at you, be like, yo, you're this kind of person. And that's not what we want to do. But when they come to these Galileans, they limited these men to less than average work ethic, less than average education. What can Galileans do to change the world? Go read the rest of the book of Acts. Those Galileans went on to change the world, went on to convert and to, you know, bring people to Christ, thousands upon thousands upon thousands. A Galilean actually end up working alongside a Pharisee. And they work together for the cause of Christ. So nobody, no matter what judgment you make about them, is above being changed, being redeemed, and being of service to God. As I already brought up, many times people see Jesus, and they see him eating with sinners and tax collectors. What happens when you see someone eating with sinners and tax collectors? You associate that person with they're doing the same things they're doing. When someone witnessed that person going into that place they shouldn't have been late at night, what did they assume? He's partaking in the same activities as everybody else. He's living like the world, right? He's doing this and this. And when we finally found out, we went, right? You, sometimes you live and you learn, right? And that's why we know people make snap judgments. That's why we got to be careful of what we do and how we act and behave. But we also can't control everything that everybody's going to think. Finally, I think the elders here and Joe has been a big push and Don's been a big push. You know, stop caring what people think. If you're doing what's right, and Jim Wilsford, you say that all the time. If you're doing what's right, and if you're working for the Lord, no matter what people think and what people see, as long as you know what you're doing is, is sincere and you love God, what other people are going to think, they're going to think anyway, right? Some people make judgments. You could prove them otherwise. And so we can't live our lives hamstrung, you know, by people and allowing them to shackle us but we also got to be careful. Uh, 1 Samuel 16 and 6. Surely this is the anointed one of God. Now in 1 Samuel 16, who's being anointed here? Well, David normally, but this statement is not made about David, is it? It's made about the oldest son. When Samuel is told to go to the house of Jesse to anoint God's king, and a king looks like a king, right? He's regal. He's got, you know, he's got the, the height. He's got the shoulders for it, right? He's got the confidence of a king. He's got the demeanor of a king. And so as soon as Samuel walks in and sees the oldest, he goes, surely this is the anointed one of God. Surely the anointed one of God is in front of me right now. And God says, no, no, no. Keep going down the list. And finally, David, who's not even in the room, right? Not even in the room has to be called out because even his own father didn't believe he'd make the selection process. He's finally called in and the Lord says, this is my anointed. You judge based on appearances, but I judge based upon people's hearts. And what I want us to get out of this morning, what I want us to understand, I can't see hearts. I can't. I try my best not to make judgments, they happen, right? All of us at any time are going to make quick judgments, but we can't allow those quick judgments to handicap 
our relationships with others, right? Sometimes the, what you judge them by is right. Like the tax collector, he had some knocks against his resume. He had some things in his life he understood and he knew. He needed the forgiveness of God from. And my point this morning is if God is willing to forgive him, and Jesus says this is the one who walks away justified, what should our forgiveness look like? There may be someone, you know, unfortunately a lot of times, you know, if someone's, well, I don't want to name certain sins, but let's say someone does a sin, they become that sin. They've only done it once, but they become identified for the rest of their life as the person who did this or the person who did that, and they can never escape that. In the church is a place where people ought to be able to escape being identified from as their sin. It should be a place where it's no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, right? Sinner, we're all sinners, right? We are all what? We're all Christians. We're all lovers of God. We're all people who give our heart and need the redemption from our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we got to be careful of our snap judgments. Um, so how can, how, can we, how can we filter? What's a good filter? Because we, also, we obviously have to make some kind of judgments, right? Jesus will say, do not cast your pearl before swine. So what do you have to do to know someone's a swine? You have to make judgments. But I'm talking about those quick first impressions. You identify somebody as something, and they are that for the rest of their life. Now, there are people, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, you will know their tree by their fruits, if they live a life that is constantly this, 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 even with you trying to teach them and help them, finally, even Jesus would say, you brood of vipers, right? You brood of vipers. How I've not tried Israel to gather you as a hen would gather its children and you continue to reject me. Yes, there's a time in which we can go, okay, right? But there's also, I don't believe, a time when we completely give up on somebody where they think, where we think they're a lost cause. Because how many people do you know who were a lost cause, who are no longer a lost cause? I have many people in my life, one being my very own uncle, who if you were to ask me, would this person ever darken the doors of a church building, I would laugh. I would laugh. I would be like, there's no way. They've tried for years. My grandmother tried for years. My grandmother's dead. The best shot was my grandmother, and she's gone. And yet, even my uncle, six weeks before he passed, decided to give his life over to Christ. I mean, when you watch, and my dad explains to me the change that happened in his life for his last six weeks, it's incredible. You would have never thought about it. You would have never thought it. Even to the day he died, you would have thought that even death itself would not scare this man. Death has a way of doing that. So love, right? Love's our first filter. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And, you know, we read these a lot of times during marriages, you know, marriage ceremonies. And um, but that's really kind of where it goes, right? I, of course, love needs to identify my marriage. I've chose to love my wife. Therefore, all these, these are pretty easy, right? Well, if you've ever been in a marriage, these aren't always that easy, are they? Right? Um, but let's read. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, love is patient. That means when somebody does do wrong, you are to what? You're going to be patient with them. Do you judge them once and forevermore based upon how they've treated you that one time? Man, my people I know, almost gave away too much information. Um, nobody here, by the way. They still talk about people who, who did them wrong in the third grade. I'm not kidding. In the third grade and still don't like Betty Sue because of a third grade experience. These 
individuals are now in their 60s. And they still hold grudges on people from what they were done to them in grade school. Really? Are we there? I mean, are we there as a society? Love is patient and kind, does not envy, does not boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice with wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Once again, you're not, just because you're not wanting to make judgments and hold people over their sins over their head, it also doesn't mean you allow sins to just, you know, continue in people's lives, but you rejoice with the truth when someone obeys the truth, comes to the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And I like that hopes all things, because when I think about people in their lives, one of the things that when I see a person and they look a certain way, can I still be hopeful that that person isn't who what I perceive them to be? I think love needs to do that. And if love ever stops that, if love ever closes the door of seeing this person more than what I first, that first impression, then that person will never be more than the first impression that I gave them. But ultimately, it comes down to mercy. James chapter 2 is riddled with mercy. Starts off with, let's say someone walks into your, your church building. They've got the nice... I, did, I chose purposely to wear this suit coat this morning. And all the comments that I've heard about how you know, nice I look and you, know, you can dress, you, you know, you're dressed up, you look good. I don't hear that when this is off. You know, it's, it's interesting. And I'm not making you know, any judgments on those people. I knew it would happen. And one of the reasons I did it was you know, for that effect a little bit. You know, you get those comments. People, as soon as, soon as you put this on, all of a sudden you, you take on a prestige that with this off, the prestige is gone, right? The honor is gone. Well, when a man walks into your auditorium looking all nice and fa- I almost wore a tie too, but that, that had been going too far, right? Um, gold jewelry looks nice. Come sit right here. Come sit next to me. In, in our day and era, we kind of are above that. We don't live in that stark of a contrast. Let's just say someone's clean, right? They're clean shaven. Their, their clothes are, look nice. They smell like they bathed at least in the last day or so, right? And you're okay with that person shaking their hand, giving them a hug, seeing how they're doing, asking who they are, where they're from. But it's the people that come in Man, did he just wake out of bed? Was he up late last night doing something he ought not have been doing? He's here. He is here. Which what, what you're seeing, especially these, a lot of times these people come by themselves. Now, sometimes they come and you think, well, what kind of money are they looking for, right? You know, sometimes you ask those questions. But I, I try my best not to jump there first. You look at an individual, they're coming in, they're here to worship God, and you've got to have hope that just maybe, maybe, just maybe, they're here for God. But you know what? The opposite is true with the man who looks nice and dresses nice. Just because they're here does not mean they're what? They're here to worship God and they're the most righteous individuals. Go to James 2. Look what, look what James says. He says, look at verse 5, or look at verse 4. Have you not then, when you pay attention to who, what they're wearing, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So when these snap judgments come to our head, do we blame, well, he shouldn't have been dressing like that. If he don't want people to think about him like that, then why does he look like that? That's not what James says. You have become judges with evil thoughts. You have taken their appearance and defined who they are by what they look like. Who's the one in the wrong here? Not the man who's come in, who's the poor 
you know, haggard man. It's the one who's, who's judging that man with evil intentions, evil thoughts. Uh, where am, oh, there I am. Um, he says, listen, my beloved brothers, and I love that, listen. Like he's wanting, to, he's wanting to get to their very hearts. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which has promised to those who love him? Why is it that Jesus in the first century church had such success with poor people, with the outcasts, with those who don't fit in society, with those who aren't your, you know, polished up business class, middle, even middle class men or women, families. Why is it? The gospel, as Jesus says, I have come for those who are sick and know they are sick. And most of the time, those who are without understand all that they are without. Those who have never even think about what they are without. What they don't have. What they need from someone else. It's not to say that rich can't enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not to say middle class can't enter the kingdom of heaven. But who are you going to have better success with? Who did Jesus have better success with? And yet, when we go out, who's the first people? We want people that look like us, Right? around the same age as I am. That's who I'm more comfortable with and all these kinds of things. And maybe, but we got to be careful. And James goes on to say, it's all about having mercy. And he takes it from what people look like to even their sins. You say, I'm not a murderer, but you've committed adultery. And therefore you're starting to elevate sins. He says, but if you've messed up on one aspect of the law, what have you messed up on? All of it. You are an equal sinner with the murderer in the eyes of God when it comes to your redemption, your salvation, your separation from God. The weight of it, the penalty of it is sin and death, is it not? Sin or is death, is it not? And James goes on to say, it's those who have mercy. Those who commit the royal law, which is to love your neighbor, Right? Those are the ones that when you show mercy, God will what for you? Show mercy unto you. And it's what uh, Justin brought up today. Uh, I liked his little, um, uh, I'll, I'll call it a mini sermon before your lesson. But that's, that's, I'm not using that in a negative way. I know a lot of people, um, but I liked it because really the best way about getting away from judging people is you yourself try to live a good life and every day do something good for somebody, no matter what they look like, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done. You are only responsible for who? For yourself in doing what is right, in doing what is good, okay? And so you understand that you need mercy because if you were to measure your goodness and how good you are on an everyday basis compared to what God expects, what do you understand? I don't measure up. So if you want to go to heaven one day with the mercy of God, what do you need to give others? You need to give people mercy because, as I said at the beginning, you don't know what people are going through, right? You don't know the life they were born into. You don't know. I mean, I was born into a pretty good family, okay? Had a pretty good upbringing, raised in church, right? So I had a better chance in many ways. I've got people who's like, they grew up in a place nowhere near a church building, didn't even know what church is, were probably anti-church, their families were, they're going to need some work. You can't expect that person to be, you know, the moment you speak to them about Jesus, oh yeah, I'm ready to accept that. It's going to take some work. You got to love people. Luke 18, here's the final conclusion. Loved people, love people. The Pharisee loved himself, therefore he looked down on others. If we are to stop looking down on others, we need to stop loving ourselves in the haughty, prideful, look what I've done way. But we need to love ourselves with the love that God has loved us with, which is full of mercy and compassion and kindness and long suffering. And therefore we take that love that we've received and we can't help but give it to others. We can't help but, and let me tell you, the moment you choose in your mind to love someone, those snap judgments don't even cross your mind anymore. 
If you make it in your mind, I'm going to love this person, I'm going to think best of him, and I hope the best of him. Now, they may prove you wrong. They may, through their own actions and their own fruit or whatever, prove you wrong. But our job is to not make those quick judgments. And I think, just think, that if the church would stop making snap judgments about the world in which we live. Listen, I have seen too many, and I'm going to pick on the older generation just for a moment, and I'll be there one day as well, I know. We pick on the young a lot, so I'm going to pick on the old for a moment. I am kind of in a weird place where when I was growing up, I think a lot of the stuff that's going on today was starting, but I kind of had blinders on sometimes and kind of just kind of walked through it. But when you look at these 16, 17, 18 year old kids who are doing things that you thought, I would have never done that as a 16, 17, 18 year old. And you know what? I believe you're right. But you know what? I also believe that if that same 16, 17 year old who you're seeing is doing this bad thing in today's world, if they were raised the way you were raised and when you were raised, they would not be doing what they're doing today either. We have a generation who's being taught from infancy what their gender is is not really their gender, right? We, we have from infancy and, and saying that nothing's wrong, there's no, you know, no such thing as sin, no such thing as hell, God's not. They have been hearing that for 16, 17 years of their life. You have to ask yourself, what are you expecting out of these kids? And if the church can't get past what these kids have done, the lifestyles they're living in currently, and be able to reach out with the gospel to help them, what chance do they ever have going on the rest of their life to ever change? If you think it's going to be the, we got to have the right president in place, you're wrong. If you think it's the right politicians in place, you're wrong. It's Jesus. It's the church. We need to be there for these, this generation. We need to be there for them. We need to become surrogate families. That's what the church is. It is a family. Let them know there is something better out there. And to me, that's the best form of evangelism. Flavel Yeekly said, find a hurt and heal it. Now, people aren't always hurting monetarily, physically. Most people are hurting where? Spiritually, emotionally, internally. They're struggling with life. There are things some of these 16, 17 year old kids that are dealing with weight wise, gravity wise, things they've had to deal with their families and what they've watched and witnessed that some of us can't even believe until you hear. So this morning, first, if you are in need of the gospel this morning, and the gospel is the fact that every person in here, sitting here and throughout the entire world, we are all sinners. No matter what sin you've committed, Jesus has promised that his blood is able to forgive it. And when he forgives it, you stop become identifying with your past. You're no longer what your past defines you as, who your past says you are. You are now a new creature in Christ. And if you are looking for that, want that, maybe you're not ready for that, but want to talk about it, let's study with you, let's talk with you, let's talk about Jesus, what he has to offer, who he is, what he expects, all those things, so you don't come in blindfolded, right? We want you to know the whole story before you decide to make a rash snap decision this morning and then tomorrow, you know, it'd be a flash in the pan and gone. But also this message, if you're a Christian, are we to make judgments? Yes. But we are to make good judgments. We are to make calculated judgments. We are to make judgments that are also full of mercy and compassion, allowing people to make mistakes, allowing people to err, allowing people not to be the standard by which we think they ought to be, because we're not even there ourselves. And so this morning, maybe you've made those judgments. Maybe it's hurt your relationship as, with a brother and sister in Christ. Maybe it's hurt your relationship in your family. Maybe it's a hurt relationship with those of your neighbors out in the world. If you need the prayers of the church, encouragement of the church, please come forward now as we stand together and as we sing.